I, I think it's gonna last, but in case it doesn't, what should I do? I have what? a charger, it just doesn't reach. Though. I know. Uh, do you have a power cable right now? But how much do you have? A 99? 94. Okay, we're gonna be fine. Does it make it through? Yeah, if it doesn't, we'll ring it up. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll dig up some. Uh, otherwise, if we put this one, it's just a couple of. Is it? Well, you know, yeah. It's good. We'll just pull this out if it dies. I don't think we need to do it. Okay. No, I, and I have a charger there. Well, that. Alright. We'll be good. I agree. If we see the, some signs. We'll make a joke out of it. Yeah, we'll make it part of the performance. It's okay. <laughs> Start I don't know why the music. Well, I was <laughs> trying to, but Which for some reason. Do you have a favorite? I, the first one is my favorite. Yeah. This one is, but I don't know if it's. Well, this is fine. That's it not working. I cannot. I can also do this. Maybe why it's actually. Should play music, but it might be my computer. Might be the browser. Parsons, I'm chair of the Designed Objects programs within AIADO uh, here at SAIC. And welcome to our second Mitchell lecture for this fall series. And um, as always, we're grateful uh, for the gift that allows us to. Uh, can you hear? You can't hear? Okay, sorry. Maybe I have to turn the music off. All right. Okay, sorry. I'll try and get a bit closer to the mic. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, we're very grateful for the gift uh, um, that was given to provide for this lecture series by William H. Bronson and, and Grace uh, Slovet Mitchell. Um, but the success of these talks is really down to you, uh, the audience. So 
we, I want you to help spread the word uh, about these lectures. You know, they're free and open to the public. Uh, so uh, as you meet people and as you, uh, you know, network in your community, please feel free to invite people uh, to come to these talks. Uh, the next lecture is on October 17th uh, by Rick Lowe. Uh, he's a Houston-based artist, uh, best known for his Project Row Houses uh, community-based art project. Um, so uh, it will have not escaped your notice that we live in rather tumultuous political times. And um, SAIC's president, uh, Elissa Tenney, frequently reminds us of the key role that we play as uh, creative individuals in uh, maintaining the values that we all hold dear, and uh, especially when those values seem to be under threat. Um, and several years ago, SAIC uh, went through a process of actually trying to encapsulate its own kind of core values. And as a cynical British person, uh, I didn't expect too much to come from this process. Uh, you know, mission statements often kind of ring rather hollow. Uh, um, uh, the five sta statements that emerged, though, uh, which are, we are explorers, uh, meaning and making are inseparable, uh, we are artists and scholars, although they missed out designers, we're designers, artists and scholars, um, Chicago and we make history are all things that in a way should be kind of self-evident but somehow having them spelled out uh, was reassuring um, and inspired by this the, you know the design objects faculty also drew up a list of their own core values and the top of this list was a word, word which I'm sure you're all very familiar with here which is criticality so our document stated that criticality is the vital ingredient in reframing object design as a social and cultural force and in crediting people as engaged thinkers instead of passive consumers. So when done well, criticality has this quality of uh, freeing us, a kind of emancipation, or at least helping us see things in a new light. And I mention this because tonight's speaker has a particularly acute understanding of critique in relation to design. Giovanni Anella, um, our design objects visiting artist for this year, has a PhD on the subject of design critique. Uh, Giovanni completed his PhD at Northumbria University uh, in the UK uh, in 2014. And prior to that, he has held positions at the Madeira Interactive Technologies Institute and the Interaction Design Institute in Ivrea. He's also a graduate of the Design Academy in Eindhoven and the Politecnico di Torino in Italy. On his talk tonight, which is uh, entitled Brushing, Rubbing, Scraping, Sampling the World We Live In, will give us an overview of his practice, including his ongoing body of work, Design and Its Double, which is a critical investigation into the representation of design its rhetoric, aesthetics, and economics. So please join me in welcoming Giovanni. Hello. I'm very happy to be here. I feel, I feel very lucky. Um, maybe earlier you heard the music playing. It's, uh, it's a project that I will present, but it's a project that I feel comfortable presenting in very few places. And this is one, and I think it's a good sign. Uh, I think it makes me feel like I'm in, I'm in the right place. I, I live in Japan, like the past five years I've lived in Japan, and not always I get to present this kind of work and the other work that I will present um, there. So I'm very happy to, to be here. Uh, the first, I, I made a list of things that I should say and a list of things that I shouldn't say. <laughs> and I, and I, I'll make sure uh, I say them both. <laughs> um, the first thing that I should say is that I recently published this book. It's called Going Real. It's published by Vernon Press, written by me and Marco Petroni. Um, you can buy it. <laughs> for uh, something like $25 soft cover and something like 40 something dollars hard cover. Because it's a, it's, a it's a very hard cover, <laughs> I guess. Um, 
so this one we got we got it sorted done um I, I usually open the, the, um, my talks with my design works because I, I kind of have to, I don't know, justify myself. I um, make sure that I let everyone know that I, I am a designer indeed. And um, one of the projects, this is something I, I tell my mother because my mother, she doesn't know what I do. So I say, no, I, I make this stuff. <laughs> and um, the first project is, uh, is called Dowry. It's a, it's an old, it's a commission. Uh, that came from a small uh, ceramic um, factory in, uh, in Italy. And they, wanna, uh, they commissioned a, a number of designers to reflect on uh, Southern Italian traditions. And one of the traditions in Southern Italy is uh, the one of the dowry. So when a couple gets married, they get this set of very expensive dishes that you never use because they are too expensive and you keep them in a vitrine, and my parents have it, it's kind of like a monument to, to your marriage, but you never get to use it. So for them, I did this, uh, is it gonna, ah, I have to do this. Yeah, so it's, um, it, it's a stack, it's a set of 24 dishes that you can use, but uh, you don't need to keep in a vitrine because when you stack them together, they look like a vase. Uh, like an archetypal vase. Um, uh, and now it's being taken by an, another company in, uh, in Italy that is known for ceramic. Uh, that is called um, uh, Ceramic Gatti. And, uh, and every time I show this project to my mother, she asks me, but how, what about the dust? She has very, very peculiar, she's like the benchmark of every designer. I mean, what about the dust? How, how do you take out the dust? Uh, I don't know about that. The second project, I go very quickly about this because the presentation is not really about these two projects. I need them just to, to feel like I'm in a design school and I'm a designer. Uh, the second one is called Rolling Stones. Uh, it's, uh, it's a table for a, for a marble company. Uh, it, they make money out of tiles. That's how you make money if you have a marble company. Uh, but in the past, they used to make furniture, uh, marble furniture, which was popular in Italy until the, um, before World War II, I would say, um, or right after it. And then it became um, not so popular anymore because it's, as you can imagine, marble furniture is extremely heavy and people don't want it when they live in a smaller spaces like, like, like it happens nowadays. So for them, I designed this marble table that has this special trick. Uh, it sits on, uh, on marble balls, um, and there is a, a ball bearing hidden. So that means that um, you can move it. It weights, it weights a ton. Uh, it weights 100 kilos, but you can move it. It's a way to make um, heavy furniture uh, great again. <laughs> Um, and this is actually, this is one of the things I shouldn't have said. Um, and this is my brother moving. It. We have the same, the same hairstyle. So uh, my father kind of styled it for the, for the whole family. <laughs> and, um, and and these projects are are fine. Um, they are, they are okay. I am. I never know how to make the transition between these, these projects and the second part uh, of the presentation. And once recently, a few years ago, I gave this talk in, a, in another university, um, in, in Parsons, we can say, <laughs> at Parsons, at the product design department. And I said, um, it's great to work on this project after dinner. I said, I think a designer should, uh, should work on this kind of project after dinner. And they got outraged. The, the teachers were like, how do you dare so come in here and say these things? And I, I was like, ah, this product design course. Huh? And, um, and it was for a job, and I didn't get the job. Uh, and, I, and I think it's, it's not what I meant. <laughs> what I meant is that it's very important to work after dinner. Um, no, the, what I meant is that um, working on products is, 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 a, 
is a great practice. And, and I really wish I could work more on products. It just didn't happen. It didn't happen because some of the commissions that I receive are, um, they sound like this. Uh, and this is an actual commission that I received uh, last year. Last year, for a, I received this uh, call from, uh, this email from La Triennale uh, Design Museum, it's the design museum in Milan. And they were working on uh, this exhibition. It's, a, it's an exhibition that they do every three years. Uh, it's the original exhibition of why La Triennale is called La Triennale. It's a, they pick a topic, a curator, and they, they explore it. And that this year, last year, it was um, Chiara Alessi, who is a, who's a dear friend. She's from the, from the Holy Alessi family, and uh, she's a very good friend. But the commission went like that. Um, we wanted to propose a unique new design piece because the new show is not only an exhibition, it's also a shop, and it will be on sale in the, in the museum. And, uh, and you need to pay for the production. That's, uh, that's all right. And the transportation. <laughs> and we keep 45% of the sales uh, after taxes, <laughs> of course. And I thought, it, I, I wasn't sure if, I was, if it was an, an opportunity or a scam. I, I couldn't really make my mind. Um, so I, I made a little Excel sheet to make sure I got it right. <laughs> now, if you study industrial design like I did, uh, we, I grew up with this rule of the by four. Like if you multiply production cost by four, you get something that should be your sale price. So I did the other way around. I said, okay, I want to have a product that costs around $100, 100 euros. That means I have $25 for production cost, 22 for the VAT, which in Italy is 22%. Um, which is a scam, another scam, um, and I have to give 45% to the to the museum, and I get eight dollars, and, and I made a pie chart so that it was really clear, um, and, and and I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was uh, surreal but beautiful, and and I sp I spoke to my collaborators, and we we started making an Excel sheet. Um, of sorts, um, you realize you're pretty old when you start a project with, a, with an Excel sheet. I think when you're young, you start with a sketch. And when you are growing up, you start with post-its. And when you start with a spreadsheet, you, you're old, you, you're getting old. Um, but it turned out to be a, a nice uh, Trojan horse that we put in the exhibition. It's a, it's a silk scarf that we, we sold. Chiara, the curator, obviously is smart enough to understand the irony, but also the critical part of it. Uh, it tells one side of the design industry. And it doesn't mean that it's like that for everyone. I know other people that instead make do very good business with design products. Uh, but I receive this kind of commissions, and uh, that's what I talk about. Uh, design in its double is this body of work um, that documents my, um, the way I look at design, the way design is represented, the way uh, it builds a rhetoric, the way uh, it builds an, an economy as well. But it, doesn't, it didn't start with design. The reflection started with um, politics. And I could have done this bit with Italian politics, but uh, it's an American audience. Uh, it, it works better this way. So um, uh, the elections of in California in 2003, someone from California, I know you're here. Yeah? Joshua, you remember this election, 2003? The candidates were interesting, because there was Larry Flint, who is a porn editor, still alive, right? Yeah, I think so. Because uh, Gary Coleman, yeah, what you're talking about, Will is it? Uh, rest in peace. I know he's not 
is not with us anymore. But he was one of the candidates. And then there was Jack Grisham, um, who is a singer. And Angeline, who is it's not clear who she is. She's known as the LA Billboard Queen. Um, and also Mary Carey, who is a, a, a porn star. Um, I to, when I <laughs> put together this presentation, then I thought that actually my first, I, if I recall well, in Italy, my first, the first time I voted, I did vote for a porn star. And it was Cicciolina, it was uh, Ilona Staller, who actually, and, I, and it was a, the best decision I ever made, because actually her, her um, politics were still, they're still very actual. They, she was pro abortions, gender equality, um, AIDS awareness. So actually, the, there, is no, there is no irony in this. Um, but finally, the, the people who, the people you know, elected Terminator. Terminator was the governor of uh, California. Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think he did pretty all right from, no, yeah. Um, and it's interesting because uh, they are all characters that uh, are legitimated by, by the media, right? By their visibility on the media. And then when I look at design, I see that something similar happened. You're probably familiar with a scene on TV, uh, which kind of states, it certifies that the, the real product looks like the representation and not the other way around. I, I found that very fascinated. And design has always been flirting with the media. Um, Raymond Lowy was the first designer to uh, be on the cover of, a, of the time on, on, on a, a popular publication. That was 1949. And, and I, I read that um, Raymond Lowy was also the first designer having a PR office. Uh, that is really, um, it's really what's happening now. I mean, if you have a design office and you don't have some PR practice, it's, um, you might be off. Um, this is another great picture. Um, all the American heroes of the design industry, it's, uh, the Eames, Sarinen, Bertoia, Nelson, and so on. Uh, this is 1961. And um, apart from the fact that they are all white males, and that's uh, unfortunate, but it was a different time, maybe. But what I want to point out is that this is um, Playboy. It's Playboy magazine. Um, so all these heroes of the industry were presented to the broad public. Uh, it's, a, it's a great example of a uh, designer becoming public characters. And and the story continues with uh, Philip Stark having a show on BBC. So the presence of designers in the media is not, is not a new thing. But the switch, the, the, the step after that is maybe more interesting, is when characters from the media are brought into the design industry and they are somehow legitimated by their uh, visibility. So Brad Pitt. And his uh, designs. Do you know the top one? What it is? The top right. Do you know what that is? That's a bathtub, for two. For Brad and Angelina. Um, and there are other examples. Uh, Pharrell Williams um, is doing some furniture. Vanilla is, uh, <laughs> is doing some. Uh, some lighting. Um, uh, there are a few more. I, I just I didn't include them. It, at some point, uh, it felt like um, in order to be a designer, you had to be successful in the media industry. It's kind of the opposite of what we saw before. Before it was successful people in the industry becoming then popular in the media, and now it's uh, it's the other way around. Uh, in 2011, Agatha and I, we were reflecting on this phenomenon. We set up a, 
a few small projects. Um, they were all aimed at monitoring the design industry. One was called designgraphs.org, which is still online, but doesn't function very well. And what we did was monitoring the Twitter activity of some designers and brands and see who is popular on Twitter. So whose Twitters are liked and retweet the most. It was during the Furniture Fair of 2011. Um, and one day during the fair, we saw that uh, Karim Rashid got a peak. He, he was really popular. And that, that particular tweet was particularly uh, popular. And we tried to look at what he was tweeting that must have been very interesting. And he was tweeting, create, don't destroy, make design, not war. Um, which is, um, which are interesting messages, because at the same time, they're very deep, but very shallow as well. And they reminded us of uh, pop music and how uh, pop singers use the word love. Well, love is the most melting feeling, but it's also just a rhyme, right? Um, and design is a bit the same thing. Design, the word, the term design is at the same time a haircut uh, or a pair of jeans, but it's also the one thing that is going to save the world, uh, that is going to build a better world. And that's how we came to, to design tunes in 2011. So the music that you heard earlier that maybe I can try to play again was a project of Agatha and I. And we commissioned Let's see. We sampled some interviews of people that we, we actually respect and uh, we look up to. Um, but that, like everyone else, and in including me, um, use the, the term design uh, in ways that might be misleading uh, sometimes or might create expectations that we then cannot keep up to. Um, let's see if it plays. I can do it this other way. advanced 
methodology of leadership, design leadership. The most advanced methodology of leadership possible, design leadership. The most advanced methodology of leadership possible, design leadership. Design because the world needs you now in every field. In education, business, in government. And together we will change the world. In education, business, in government. Together we will allow people around the world to live in education, business, right. government. So I, I, I recommend you to download all the other tunes. Um, there are, some of them are surprisingly good. Um, and this turned to be um, kind of anti-manifesto for us. Um, it, it broadcasts the, the voices that we respect. Um, and it also reminds us how we repeat uh, these messages without always like, um, having a reality check. Uh, we, were, we were maybe bitter at the time. We were, you should, you should keep in mind that we were in the Netherlands in a moment in which the Netherlands was, Dutch design was promising anything. Um, like uh, we would uh, clear minefields um, from landmines. We would clear the oceans and we, we would also fight um, technological, um, technology obsolescence with these modular um, mobile phones. A and what design can do, it's a conference, and yeah, what else can do? Um, we, so we were actually disenchanted by, by design. A and th so you have to put this project in, in context, uh, both in time and the place. Um, and when we thought that we were doing something really radical and, uh, and extreme, actually <laughs> two years later, Karim Rashid uh, uh, did release an album um, that was called Change the World. And it features uh, also Change the World, Karim and his robot a cappella version. Uh, I'm not going to play it now. Um, but um, designing its double didn't really start with uh, a focus on the designers. I was, um, I was actually focused on objects. Uh, you, you have to understand that I studied design in Torino, and Torino is, um, is an industrial city, and we were trained to make all those objects that you never see on the, on the magazines. Like, we would make industrial um, protection. We would make stuff like this one. Not even, this one has some chances of being on, uh, on the media. But um, at the same time, all the examples of design that were brought to us were these beautiful icons that we never encounter in the real world. And when I was in, in Eindhoven at the Design Ac uh, Academy of Eindhoven, I had the chance to, to reflect on this. This is a screenshot of 2007. Uh, when you would uh, look for La Chaise by, by Ims on Google Images, you will get something like this. Now it got a bit smarter and it provides you more angles, but at the time you will get uh, just a, a silhouette, basically, the same, the same angle, this angle, of this object that I had never seen and that uh, finally in Eindhoven I got to, to have, to live with for a few weeks, I, I borrowed it. Um, and I, I will look at it and study, look at it from all the different angles. And again, if you are a, an industrial designer, usually the most interesting part of a chair is the bottom, because you, you see the injection molding, the, the commercial information, the structure. A and that's also the part that is never depicted in the magazines. You never get to see it in the magazines. So. I developed this technique um, of um, covering the objects with, with silicone because I then would unfold them and have these 
representation, this very objective representation of the object, um, of, of all the objects, every part. And the hierarchy would not be there anymore. So front, back, sides, everything had the same importance. This was the time where I still refused to take decent photos because I, I had this idea that photos are, um, are a scam and uh, you shouldn't, in design, we, we shouldn't look at photos. Um, and I did it with a, with a number of objects. It was a way for me to document, archive the objects and also to, to study them. I had to brush every part of it. That's how, that's how a Universale a chair by Joe Colombo looked like. And one thing I, I always been fascinated is that it doesn't matter how beautiful the object is. These um, skins, these shrouds are, um, are ugly. They're, they're extremely ugly. Um, and I always thought they're a bit like the ugly photos of the beautiful people. And, and, uh, and you can't tell me, you cannot tell me these are not uh, truthful representation, right? They, they might be more truthful than the beautiful photo that we see. Um, believe it or not, I, I kept on doing that for 10 years. I, I, I cover object with silicon, then eventually silicon goes on the clothes. And, um, and, and, uh, and that's actually the other bit is that um, all every critical project, every project I do in design and it's double, then inform my other projects, including the ones that I do with, with my wife um, with, uh, with clothing. Um, I was telling you, I live in Tokyo and there is one gallery that I work with, it's called Cave. Uh, and two years ago, I had my, my solo show there and it was a kind of retrospective um, that put together all my design and its double projects, uh, which is not only the silicon skins, there are others I, I'm not gonna present tonight, um, but you can see on the website. And there, uh, it was a time in which this collection of objects designed by Naoto Fukazawa for Muji was re released. It was highly fetishized on the media and was depicted in this way. And I made this, uh, the same technique that I was describing earlier with these uh, skins that look um, uh, questionable. Um, <laughs> Um, and the exhibition looked like that. Uh, the, we had the actual object in the center of the room um, exhibited in the way that it would be l not like a display. And then the, 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 the skins are on the, on the walls. As I say, there, are, there were all the other projects um, that I've collected through the years, including the music that you were listening to. Uh, but there was an entirely new project, and that was this project that I'm going to show you right now. Uh, we have to do this trick. Okay. No. How do we do this? Yeah. <laughs>
and it takes these uh, snippets of information, sometimes photos, sometimes uh, titles or parts of articles. And of course it works as a metaphor to uh, say that the design discourse is often self-referential and it happens within the design community, just like, like mine now. Um, but it also would um, give back these mashups, these visual mashups, um, which sometimes were uh, uh, particularly interesting, like this one. Sometimes they were just aesthetically interesting because they would mm, reiterate this very sleek um, uh, aesthetic that design stubbornly uses. Um, this one was a particularly lucky one because uh, there was a uh, Philip Stark posing in front of the dollar sign and then Abitare, pub the, the design magazine, published this um, short article about a, a truffle slicer. Where is your truffle slicer? <laughs> so, um, which is uh, produced by, by Alessi. <laughs> um, this other one also was interesting because uh, Karim, Karim Rashid comes back with his list. Uh, this is his uh, Instagram account. My favorite things, daughter, love, design, music, films, <laughs> eyeglasses, organic wine, art, exercising, espresso. A and it represents very well what we were saying earlier with design tunes. Um, so it was um, a kind of, it was a continuation of this part of my practice, which is really about documenting, archiving. And whether it's related to design or not depends by the, the context, the, um, the opportunity. So the project with the printer informed pretty much directly this other project, which instead is not about design. Um, this is a project, uh, a collaboration between uh, VCU, Virginia Commonwealth University in Qatar, and and my university, which, I mean, in the person of myself, and my colleague, Kanebako-san. Um, and the project was about exploring the relationship between Qatar and Japan. And for a few weeks, uh, we banged our head um, against um, this connection that we couldn't find. Uh, and finally, it was re revealed to us that actually Qatar and Japan have a very strong bond uh, that people are not aware of. Uh, and that is um, LNG, liquid natural gas. It's a relationship that starts with Fukushima. So when the Fukushima disaster happened, um, Japan had to shut down most of the nuclear plants and they found basically they found themselves from one day to another needing energy to import energy at the same time Qatar had a peak of production and this relationship started and Japanese people Qatari people are not really aware of that um, and it, it resulted the project resulted in uh, two installations, one in Doha, one in, uh, in Tokyo.
take the web looking for uh, information that is related to the Japanese, uh, well, it depends. Uh, there was a script, basically, so the show would run in circle, in, uh, in loops, and it would start with uh, Fukushima, so the printers that represent Tokyo would uh, print content uh, related to the Fukushima disaster, and then uh, slowly uh, they would, uh, other printers from an, the other side of the of the exhibition would print um, content about the lifestyle in uh, in Doha in Qatar or the production of gas and they will all together try to depict this complex relationship of geopolitics between Qatar and Japan and because the papers were taken from one section of the exhibition to another and fed again in the in the printers you would again have these mashups um, which i'm going to show you in a second uh, so these printers would print content about the relationship the economic relationship so there were all the lng routes or uh, um, the agreements between the countries uh, you know, these ministries, um, shaking hands, businessmen, and so on. Uh, when we did the exhibition in Qatar, the setup was different. We had these two lines. And uh, so one day they would print content about Japan, another day about Qatar, another day about the, the relationship, the economic relationship between the two. And it was like a dispatch, a news dispatch that you would, um, you would receive but the final outcome were these mashups, um, which I think were successful uh, successful in uh, in uh, in representing the complexity of this re relationship. So, if you see the first sheet, that's uh, a scene from Fukushima, uh, while the one above is about the production of L LNG. This one again is the the tsunami, the roots of. Um, uh, the the sheep the ships were the exports and then a photo of uh, Messi uh, who was uh, sponsored by Qatar Airways so somehow they they do represent um, this very complex relationship A and sometimes the visuals were really striking that's uh, pure coincidence we got this uh, LNG carrier overprinted on a Japanese interior, uh, which then over overlaps with a uh, camel uh, race, maybe. Uh, here is a, so an LNG stocking um, the stocks, the, the docks that are in, uh, in Japan, overlapping with, uh, with, uh, with the s skyline of, of Doha with these skyscrapers. And then sometimes you will get these um, some random elements, like it, it came out the word origami. I don't know why. Um, uh, that, that's another beautiful one. That, that building, the one that looks like a tree, is by um, Isozaki-san, uh, Isozaki, uh, and it's in in Qatar. And then it overlaps with this. Uh, uh, landscape where uh, one of the biggest LNG um, deposits are in uh, in Japan. Um, sometimes there were sentences: Japan purchased helium from Qatar, and uh, and then just by chance, randomly, there is some celebration uh, from a car race. Um, the last project I want. We have time for a last project. Yeah. I wanted to show you is this one, it's Geo Merchant. And then I will tell you why, how this relates, this two last project relates to what I was doing uh, with design in Istanbul. So this is a project uh, that we did in, uh, in 2015 and was shown at during the Fori Salone and then now is currently on show at the Triennale in the Broken Nature show, which is curated by, by Paolo Antonelli. And it's a project I've done with Jonathan Gatto uh, who is this uh, guy? <laughs> he started um, with a, a research 
we couldn't understand how it gets hair. So we <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's a it's a research about plants. Um, uh, it, are you familiar with the term uh, phyto extraction or phyto extraction? You probably say phyto mining. So it's a very simple principle. Uh, it's basically the ability of plants of uh, absorbing metals from the soil, and and some and then um, holding it into the leaves and until the leaves fall down. Um, and some plants are particularly good at absorbing some metals. So, for example, the Rhinorea nicolifera <laughs> is very good at uh, absorbing nickel, while uh, this other one absorbs zinc very fast. Um, now, uh, this is an information that if you, if you know about uh, biology, you, you, you're probably familiar with. Um, instead, if you're, if you're coming from economics, maybe what you're familiar with is the fact that every metal, not only gold and silver, but any metal has a market value that changes every two minutes. And, I, and this value is established, is decided in, in London at the metal exchange, the London Metal Exchange. Um, our project put together these two information. So uh, the installation looks like this, and I'm gonna show you a short a video, which is round because it was projected on, on that table. For a long time, a factory has occupied this land. This factory produced parts for the motor, electronic and clothing industry. The factory didn't survive the crisis and closed. Leaving behind a land contaminated by heavy metals. People appropriated this land. Not aware of the past, they started growing vegetables. But the products of these fields weren't safe and couldn't be consumed or traded. The farmer realized that the metals in the soil represent a capital, a resource to exploit. Plants can extract those metals. From the roots, metals travel all the way to the leaves. Leaves can be harvested, burned, and the metals are so collected. This process is called phyto-mining. So the old technique of crop rotation was still used, but according to other criteria, Times farmers follow the trends from finance. Using hyperaccumulators, extracting over 200 kilograms of heavy metals per hectare every year. Crossing breeds to create species with higher biomass and metal intake resulting in new hype accumulators for precious metals. Slowly we could move from a farm of metals to a wood of metals or even a forest. So the, the installation would function like that. There, there are these units that we call the extraction units. Um, they are simply hyper accumulators so plants that are very good at absorbing a specific metal um, whose roots are uh, immersed into a water solution that contains that metal um, and then you see these two sensors is uh, uh, we, we collaborated with a swiss company 
they, what they do is detecting every two minutes uh, how much metal the plant is absorbing. So they, they tell us how good the plant is doing, how well the plant is performing. And then they send the information to this computer, which is connected to the London Metal Exchange. And so now this computer knows how much is the metal worth every two minutes. And the two information are put together, and they're sent to these uh, printers, these plotters, uh, that make a graph um, that tell us about the value of the plant multiplied by hectares. So they tell us how much the plant is, is worth. And the installation altogether looks like that. Um, it looks like this when we presented it the, f the first time. Um, and, and there are these elements um, hanging. Uh, they, are, they are resin uh, blocks that contain the leaf, which has been cleared so that you can, there you go, so that you can see uh, the structure. Basically, you can see where the metal goes. And what you see at the base is the, is the dust of the metal. So these elements, they don't do anything. They just uh, help, the, they, they help the visitor understanding what the exhibition is about. Now, this project, like the previous one, uh, minus 162, which, by the way, is the temperature at which gas become liquid. I forgot that bit. Um, they, they are all about getting information and receiving information and broadcasting it, displaying it to the, to, the, to the audience in some ways that is more or less engaging in a process um, that is more or less engaging. And um, when I prepared this, this presentation, I realized that actually documenting became one of the, one of the main activities in my, in my practice. Uh, so whether it's a, a spreadsheet that documents actually the budget of a, of a project or uh, whether it's uh, covering objects with silicones or uh, hanging printers, what I'm doing lately is um, documenting some data, uh, receiving it, broadcasting it. Now, I use, you know, there was irony in what I said earlier. Actually, the truth is that I wish I could design tables and chairs and, uh, and the dishes. And I think that you should do it. <laughs> you sh and you should try to make it a profitable practice. At the same time, I think that um, in this time, there is a, a critical meaning in documenting things in showing data and um, finding a way that is not necessarily understandable, but finding a way that communicates, uh, that um, somehow gives you a sense of what is happening or what might happen. This project, for example, is not really about telling you nature is valuable, it might, um, uh, this project is more about telling you, look how scary our financial world is. We, c we could give a, a, a monetary value to anything, including the landscape that surrounds us. Um, the one I showed earlier, the relationship between Qatar and Japan, again, it's, it's a relationship that you, you should look critically, uh, like, it can tell you many things. It can tell you, look how good is Qatar, because they actually made a very, a very good deal for Japan when Fukushima happened. But you could also think, uh, look how dependent two countries are, one from another, even if they are so far away, and how geopolitics uh, work. And the same goes for the, for the silicon skins. You know, they, they, they can tell you something very simple, like, look at how much work there is behind the chair. Look at the best part of the chair is not the one that the media is trying to sell you. It's actually at the bottom where there is a, a complexity 
um, that someone has been undertaking. So uh, that's why I thought that this presentation was meaningful at, at this point. Um, you don't have to look for a truth. I, I think when I was doing the, 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 the silicon skins, I was obsessed with this idea of the truth. I had to show the truth. There isn't a truth. Um, but looking for one, it's, um, it's worth it. It's worth enough. Um, when, when I was a kid, um, there is this story that when I was a kid, I was making some drawings, some paintings. And I, one of the dra drawings that I was trying to do was uh, drawing light. And, and my brother, whom you have got to meet, <laughs> uh, is older than me. Uh, and he, he, he's a dentist now. He comes from I I science, let's say. He said, you stupid, why are you drawing light? You can't draw light. Because light is, a, is an emitting, uh, you know, I, don't let me do that. I, I don't know how to explain. But uh, light is emitting, and the drawing instead is taking, um, is taking light. So you will never be able to, to depict light. Um, but the process of doing it was, was worth it. All this collection of attempts, like the silicon skins or like these projects, I think are what make um, a path. Um, and even though they all fail at some point, I think uh, they're worth doing. That, that's my message for you. Keep on failing, maybe. It's OK. <laughs> that's all. <laughs> So I've got to know Giovanni over the last few weeks, and I know that he's very open to questions. <laughs> and so please don't be shy. Um, I'm sure he'll be very responsive to, to your oh, questions. Yeah, yeah. I like questions. Who would like to start? You're stunned. Joshua, there you go. Um, so you and I have talked about aesthetics before. And um, maybe in my, in my own practice, one of the things I'm always trying to figure out is do how much of my work comes from the visual and how much comes from something that I would call blind. Um, and, and when I look at the, the kind of words that you have up here right now, like brushing, rubbing, scraping, like these seem to be things which are very much like, they could be about the tactile, about just something physical, uh, but they, they could all be done blindly, right? Like, and there's something about the way, let's say the Silicon Project uh, maps the chairs the way a blind person might, you know, and therefore discovers something that the sighted typically might ignore, right? Um, and certainly the, what you call the, sc the scraping of the, of the internet maybe does something as well. I mean, look, when you look at the last project with the, the mining, the resultant visuals, maybe, maybe there was some kind of um, curation on your part visually, but it's also something that's truly just about extracting something that's there already. And it also is a process that could be done kind of blindly by the plants. Um, and yet still there's like a, there's, a, there's a very clear visual aesthetic to the work. Mm. And they don't feel at odds, right? Like it doesn't feel like one thing is against the other, but it feels like the content is somehow about the, the blind s scraping or searching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the presentation has some kind of visual to it as well. But have, do you think about those two things in opposition to one another? Like let's say the, the visual and the non-visual? Or, or, or is that not really an issue for you? Let's say it's an issue for me, right? But um, yeah, the, um, I never thought in that way. But um, I, I do know that I'm not. Um, I, I really struggle making aesthetic decisions. So, which for someone who studied in the Netherlands, where design translates as form giver, it's a it's a problem. Um, um, 
and I tend not to make decisions. Like uh, I think that everything should be a consequence of something that exists. The tactile aspect, um, uh, I'm not sure um, about that. Uh, like I never consciously thought in that way. I guess uh, by somehow being someone that makes uh, the struggles with aesthetic decisions, then you you rely on the other senses uh, just because um, they're less, they're not less aesthetic, that's not correct to say, but um, they're less deliberate maybe, or m less evident. Um, I, I, I can only uh, agree with your observation. I try to avoid um, making decisions, uh, for, form related decisions as much as possible. I can give you some insights. I can tell you that um, when we did this project, uh, Jonathan and I had arguments about the fact that um, he wanted these to look round, where instead I want them to be one square meter, which is less. So that would have taken away decisions, aesthetic decisions. Um, and, and when we use the printers, I try to use to find the most um, non-aesthetic printers possible, the most regular, the archetype of a printer, kind of. Um, I, I, I don't know how, I don't, like, I, it, it is something that I think myself, and I struggle with, because then when it comes to design an object, which is something I very much like, I end up making the most table table as possible, and the dishes are the most archetypal dishes which combine into the most archetypal vase as possible. Mm. I guess it has to do with this idea of documenting, and uh, documenting means that you can't make a uh, decision, uh, and you have to let what exists uh, speak. So. I think it all comes down to this desire of documenting and not creating. Mm. I'll just say one other thing. What, what's funny is that you say that in, in the Netherlands, like design is about giving form. Certainly in, like, in terms of architecture, the Dutch are famous for like, being the most bombastic form givers to decisions that seem purely functional, right? So it seems like they're also always postponing design decisions until that postponement equals some kind of crazy right. solution, let's say solution uh, like this. Out of, uh, yeah, desperate. Out of, out of never making desperate. a decision, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, Jim and I come from this school, the Design Academy, uh, which at the time I think was also about like if I think of drug in the 90s, was really about using things as they were. Uh, and I think that when you take out aesthetics, uh, then the concept comes in stronger. And then I think that when you can't avoid it um, out of desperation, as you say, you, you come out with these aesthetics that are so bold and uh, loud that maybe you can the viewer can distinguish them, can separate them from the concept. I haven't got to that point. I, got, I didn't got really fleshy yet with my aesthetics. Not really bombastic yet. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Um, so I often feel like when trying to like critique capitalism, it's so totalizing that it's like really hard for me to enter into like a critique. And I also feel like indecisive. And you kind of talked about documenting so you don't necessarily create, but you document that. But how do you, how do you like stay motivated or find like a motivation through the work? And how do you like enter in through a specific critique? Do you wait for like a relationship to form like kind of how the work with like Japan and Qatar or do you wait 
or like was there something that you pursued in this like latest project with the plants and the metal mm. they I, i'm um i'm a bit of an opportunist like i uh, i have to be so it's often the opportunity for a project comes um, and then i jump right into it um so the one of the plants for example it, i can tell you came from this uh grant that jonathan and i got um, and the grant was initiated by by jonathan he, he had to do something related to plants and then it got me involved because um, because we were living together <laughs> um, but also because um, he, he was missing a, a critical bit um, and also this one this project came from an opportunity like with uh, VCU in Qatar I, I had a, I have a relationship I, we collaborated on a few educational activities like workshops um, and then uh, w the opportunity for the project came in the form of a budget and then we looked into the relationship between the two the some projects are self-initiated especially designing its double that doesn't come from any opportunity of course um, and I think it comes, uh, part of it I is frustration, and um, I, I'm very open about it. Like when you do it, um, I, I, I live in, I, I, I inhabit the, the design industry to some, point, to some extent, um, and you see something uh, that you disagree with. Disagreement, disagreement is a good, mot yeah, how do I get motivation? disagreement <laughs> I disagree with people um, I'm a, I have a very strong antagonist um, uh, antagonistic um, character also towards myself I'm very self-critical um, and that gives me the motivation to to do a project often so if it's not opportunity it's uh, disagreement yeah Yeah. Shall we do team? I can pull other projects. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but it's funny that there's a, a lot of the things you, you're asking actually help me to reflect. Yeah, Lee is great. I just asked him that. I just noticed that he had Lee Edelcourt twice, which was interesting. It seemed, yeah, and, and I, I have to say the more, you know, this is uh, 2011, uh, so it's quite dated. And the more I look at this uh, list of people and, uh, um, and sentences, they are all really people that I look up to. Um, Lee Edelcourt uh, was, uh, she, she was the director of Design Academy at our time. A and I always thought she, she was brilliant in uh, finding new directions for, for the school and, and for her practice as well. It's really, all this work I is really about rhetorics is, is, is all about the language I don't think the messages are wrong I think that the the, the rhetorics the way they are formulated is misleading um, actually this part is nice as well um, also also Paolo Antonelli is a I it, it, it's never really a, a personal disagreement it's, a, it's often a a disagreement with the with the rhetorics and also for the um, for the silicon skins um, it came from many objects being depicted with these very sleek photos that we know design uh, uh, broadcast all the time 
And my argument was with the representation of the objects, not with the objects. The objects, I always appreciated them. I always liked them. Lee, Lee is, uh, is an interesting character. You should invite her here sometimes. Shouldn't you? You shouldn't. Oh, you should. we tried. Ah, I try harder. She's <laughs> expensive. Uh, wow, I bet, I bet. Um, we Good have time. had David Shaw here twice, though. Who did you get? We, ha we have had David Shaw here twice, her arch nemesis. Okay. Um, <laughs> you should have them together. I guess uh, uh, one thing I was going to ask is, is in thinking about... Um, this is still up and running, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, how would this, if you had the chance to revisit this, and I don't know if you'd want to or not, any thoughts on how this would change? Yeah, we spoke with Agatha about it. And sometimes it was just about, okay, let's turn it into uh, videos or uh, um, never really about the content. A and I think that the content has changed. I think that the, poli the, um, can I say? the, the rhetorics of design are not anymore these. The yeah. yeah, right? I think that, I mean, design work with buzzwords and now, for example, politics is, a, is mm -hmm. an abused word. I, th yeah. I think it's often used to, to describe something that could be described in dif with different words. So if I had to do it now, probably the, the words, the, the sentences would, would change because mm -hmm. uh, the discourse change is shifted. And I think that also designers maybe are now more careful with making promises. Like this design will clean the oceans. Mm -hmm. I mean, a few years ago, y you could hear that. Um, now, probably, we are all a bit more conscious about the power of design. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that, especially... I mean, especially with the mind clearer, that that had such a history and such a back and forth and such. Oh, it generated them sort of sort of amazing, critical questions, which kind of transpired within articles and sort of within text itself. It was almost bigger than the thing itself. Yeah, I think um, it wasn't the designer's fault. Yeah. No, I don't no, think it, it was a grad uh, project, or was it even it was a grad project, right? Undergrad, undergrad project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it, it's uh, w the the media have a, have a really a responsibility in that sense, um, and curators as well. But I think that, for example, the the show of Paolo Antonelli now mm -hmm. Broken Nature, it's uh, it's it reflects this in in the sense that it doesn't offer any solution. Mm -hmm. And maybe some years ago, instead, if you think of design and the elastic mind, it was more of a celebration of, of design, yeah. where instead uh, broken nature is, is not anymore that. It's more like using design to just tell us something, something else, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is a very is a correct way of, of using design, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily as a solution maker, but more as a language. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, it maybe it reflects the time that we're kind of in where we have so much data that we have to invent a whole new scientific discipline to be able to figure out what to do with it. Totally. Um, definitely. I I'm going to stop hogging the microphone. Yeah. It's okay. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Over there. Uh, thank you. Um, hi, Giovanni. Hey, I know uh, you're educated in Europe in a uh, Western way. Also, you lived in Japan for five years and you taught there. So I know um, how people think of life in West, in, uh, West and East is pretty different. And uh, how do you think these two different ways um, people think of design and even lifestyles um, influenced you in your design and even um, the way you think of design. Thank you. Mm, yeah, big question. Um, um, Japan informs me in, in many ways. Um, 
I don't think you really, uh, as as an as an outsider like me, um, you don't get really to experience this different perspective in life, uh, apart from maybe some episodes in which that that becomes evident. Um, what I do notice is that, well, I notice two things, but this is not really, it doesn't really have to do necessarily with Japan, but more with the context where I'm in, in Japan. Um, one is that my students um, look at the industry like the only interlocutor. Uh, so um, uh, Toshiba, Fujitsu, Sony are really the people they want to talk to. Um, but that's because I work in universities that have a strong tie with, with those companies. Um, uh, but maybe um, my students don't, are not so interested in using design to have um, a critical a dis disagreement. Uh, they don't really want disagreement. They, maybe that has to do with the Japanese way of harmony and everything flow. So they don't look for conflict. Uh, um, and, and I think they miss uh, an interesting bit of the design profession. Uh, I think that being an antagonist, having disagreement, uh, is, is, is a good reason to design something. And if you miss those, you might miss something out. Um, so, I try to bring this agreement there, and I took a little bit of harmony and peace from there into me. So that's how, that's how we balance the two. That's how I inform that context, and that's how that context inform me. Thank you. Giovanni, apart from disagreeing with yourself, uh, where, where do you find a good disagreement these days? Uh, and this is partly a question about uh, the media. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when there were a lot of printed design magazines, and there are not so many these days. Uh, and then we've obviously seen design blogs, most of which are relatively uncritical. Um, and then, of course, there's Twitter. But uh, w where do you find most kind of interesting design debates? Ah. Well, I'm afraid that interesting design debates happens behind the closed doors. Um, so I have it with my friends and collaborators. Um, and it's important to, uh, to, to build those contexts and, and to keep them. That's why I also, I mean, those relationships for me started in a school at the Design Academy, and still those are my interlocutors, the people that I disagree with and I have debate, I have discussions with. And that's why I think that as design students, you should foster those relationships, the relationships that you build here, and have arguments. It's good to have arguments. Don't, don't believe all those motivational messages that come to you that you should um, stop talking to the people you disagree with. Mm. That's not good. That also on a social scale, it, 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 leads, to, it leads to this detachment between people who disagree. Um, so I think it, it's, it, the, di the good disagreement happens once you have established a good personal relationship. And then you can discuss about anything. Um, because design is often about discussing things that are not convenient. Hmm. And having those discussions publicly all the time is maybe not the best. Because you might end up being silenced. And that's the worst that can happen. Hello? OK. Yeah, so we've had brief discussions about similarities. And one thing that 
um, came to mind as we talked about your kind of antagonistic nature. I was wondering, is it, are the end results of your project still antagonistic? And if not, where does that shift from kind of being antagonistic to kind of objective um, discussion? How does that happen in your work? Mm. I, I think it is, um, I, I try, I think I'm a bit, I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit of a coward as well. I use this idea of uh, documenting as a way for not taking responsibility towards some, for, for some of the statements. So for example, uh, the, the project, uh, the, pro the collaboration with Qatar, it, it says, well, look, your wealth actually comes from, from this thing. But it doesn't, it doesn't really state it because I, I don't, believe in that uh, entirely um, so probably the idea of documenting is a is a way for me to to provoke um, without exposing myself um, I'm trying to think of other projects there are some projects that I haven't presented and uh, that are recent they all use the language of documentation, objectivity, but also randomness, um, so that I can spark a reaction and then, and then build on that. Um, th that's how that's how my recent projects work. That's how they function. And I guess I couldn't do it with product design, and that's why maybe I, I, I happen to, to shift. But product design can, can be brought in. We just need to learn how. <laughs> Any final questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much, Giovanni. Uh, pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot, really. Those loops. Oh, yeah.